let me add my welcome again. Uh, if you didn't catch it before, my name's Nick Van Ruth. I'm one of the pastors here at Hills Baptist, and sometimes I start my sermons with cliche stories, like today. Look out. So there's this guy. Let's call him Bob. There's no Bobs. Uh, there's kind of a Bob here. Uh, let's call him um, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry. Hey, Robert, in the back, by the way. Um, uh, Jerry uh, is an interesting character, uh, a faithful guy, um, uh, and he's, he finds himself in a flood, and he's, he jumps up onto the top of his roof during the flood, and the water's rising, and so he prays to God, God, save me. And there's this person who comes along in a rowboat, rowing along and says, hey, Jerry, do you want to jump on the rowboat? And he says, no, 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 I can't do that. I'm too busy. I need to pray and God will come save me. And this person's like, all right. So he goes on and then um, the waters keep rising and then a speedboat comes along, a motorboat. And they go, quick, Jerry, jump into the, jump into the boat. And he's like, no, 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 that's all right. I'm praying. God's going to save me. <clears throat> they're like, all right. So they keep Moving on, water keeps going up, up higher, and it's up to his ankles over the roof of the house. And then a helicopter comes along, and it drops a rope out to Jerry and says, Jerry, quick, grab the rope. And he says, no, no, it's all right. God's going to save me. And then the helicopter eventually flies off, and then the water keeps rising, and Jerry dies. He drowns. And uh, it's a really happy story. And, um, and it, but he goes to heaven, so that's a good thing. And, um, and enjoys, you know, all of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Eventually comes and speaks to God. And he's like, God, why didn't you save me? I kept praying that you would save me. And God says, I sent you a rowboat, a speedboat, and a helicopter. What more do you want? Yeah, great. <laughs> Funny story. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a cliche story, but it speaks to something that I think we see in our passage, which is learned helplessness. Learned helplessness. Uh, Jerry uh, was in a state of learned helplessness. Even when help came along, he wasn't able to take the initiative to help himself. The despair of the, his situation and his, his um, stubborn reliance on his own idea of what salvation would look like led him to a state of, of learned helplessness. And I think uh, parts of the church today, and if we're honest with ourselves, parts of ourselves have learned helplessness. Because we have this, as Christians, we have this task to go and share the love of Jesus with the world, with the whole world. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, but there's so much pressure. There's so many challenges there's so many uh, problems that we're facing in our own lives that we're helpless to do anything about it. We hold ourselves back. There's no point. It's too hard a task. Or we run out of steam. We're exhausted from, gosh, the last couple of years with everything going on in the world. It's exhausting. There's too much opposition. There's too much external pressure. People don't want it. Or even uh, the fatalist view of it doesn't even matter because God's going to save him anyway. Or maybe we're just getting comfortable holding up in our own church communities, our own church buildings, waiting for the apocalypse to come and, and sorting it all out. There's always a million reasons not to do something. And that's the kind of situation that learned helplessness we see in the context of today's passage for the Israelite people back in Jerusalem. It's been a hundred years since King Cyrus has released the Israelite people back from exile, back into their promised land, into Jerusalem. And still the walls haven't been built. It's, they've been hopeless. There's no point. Have they run out of steam? Is there too much opposition? Are they just getting comfortable with this despair that they face? The question I want to ask today is how do we fulfill our prophetic purpose in the light of overwhelming despair? How do we fulfill our prophetic purpose in the light of overwhelming despair? Despair. 
Now, where we've been, we heard from Dave last week uh, preaching on uh, the first chapter of Nehemiah, where Nehemiah hears about the desperate situation back in Jerusalem. He's been uh, living in um, uh, Babylon and uh, the king Artaxerxes uh, sees how distressed he is and asks him, what's going on? And so Nehemiah shares, like my people back, the walls are decimated. Um, oh, it's such a horrible situation. And he asks King Artaxerxes if he can go back to Jerusalem uh, to, to b- rebuild the walls. And even that request alone is quite, uh, quite a big ask because he was a cupbearer for the king, a, a role of great privilege and and honor, and also a very necessary role for the king that only you know, the most trusted people would be cupbearers for the king. Not anyone could do that job. For the king to lose someone as important than, as that is a big deal. But still, Nehemiah asks if he can go. If you have your Bibles open, by the way, um, open to Nehemiah 2. It's in the Old Testament, maybe a third of the way through the Bible. Um, and then in verse 6, um, where we pick up the story. Uh, the king with the queen sitting beside him asked Nehemiah, how long will the journey take and when will you get back? Because it pleased the king to send him. Like The king was actually okay and happy to send Nehemiah on this mission to rebuild the wall. So Nehemiah gave him a time frame. And verse 7, he also asked him this, Not only does Nehemiah ask for release to go and build the walls, he asks for even more. He says, If it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governor of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. He, not only does he ask for a release, he asks for safe passage. Can you send these letters, these official letters, so that everywhere I go along the way, I can give these letters, will give me passage through your territory to where I need to go. King says, great, awesome, let's do it. Nehemiah then asks for even more, the audacity to ask not only for release, not only for passage, but for resources to build the walls and the gates. Verse eight, um, uh, uh, and may I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so that he may give me timber to make the beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. So not only does he ask for relief and release and for passage, he asks for resources from the king's own garden his own royal store of timber and and trees. He says, can you send a letter to Asaph, the the keeper of your your select, um, you know, greatest royal park? And uh, can I have all the best timber to then go use to build in a city in a different kingdom that you have nothing to do with? And the king says, yeah, sure, that sounds great. Like, he, he actually lets Nehemiah do that. He writes the letter. He sends the letter. And um, verse 8, it says, uh, The king granted his requests, not because of Nehemiah's eloquence, not because of Nehemiah's, uh, the way he asked, but Nehemiah says the answer. It says, Because of the gracious hand of God was on Nehemiah. Nehemiah trusted in God's provision. And he asked the king for some pretty big things. But at the heart of it, Nehemiah was asking God. And in the face of overwhelming despair, I wonder, are prayers too small? Could we ask big things that God could do? Opportunities for God to show his gracious hand upon us. So Nehemiah keeps traveling. He goes and he uh, travels through um, uh, the territories of uh, Sanballat and the Horonite and Tobiah, the Ammonite. Um, and they weren't too happy about uh, Nehemiah coming and, and um, sorting out Jerusalem. It says, uh, verse 10, when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone would come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. 
uh, they were very much disturbed because they were, these were the governors of the areas around Israel that were benefiting from the poverty in Jerusalem. Because poverty profits prosperous people. There's a challenge there uh, for all of us, really, prosperous people in this room. Poverty profits prosperous people. There's, oh, there's a whole thing there, but I'm just going to leave that there. You can ponder that. We'll keep moving on. We'll hear more about the opposition in, in later sermons. Nehemiah eventually arrives at Jerusalem. It's a two-year process, a two-year travel. And, um, and when he arrives, he, he gets there. He waits two days. Like after this big buildup of all this, um, these requests and all this pressure and, and everything going on, <clears throat> when Nehemiah gets there, he doesn't jump in and says, it's all right, I'm here. I'm here to come and fix everything. I'm God's gift to Jerusalem is here, finally, let's sort this out. Now he arrives and he waits three days and then secretly he goes around and he specs the walls of Jerusalem. He's heard all these horrible stories about the situation in Jerusalem and he goes and sees it for himself because he wants understanding before action. As he goes around uh, and he inspects the damage, and uh, here's a map of Jerusalem at the time. It, the, the, the black lines on the outside is the original city. After it was destroyed, um, Nehemiah built um, a smaller perimeter around Jerusalem, excuse me. And as it uh, zoomed out a bit, zoomed in a bit. Um, and so ne- from verse th- 13, we'll just like show you where Nehemiah travels, just give you an idea. So from verse 13, it says, By night I went out through the valley gate uh, towards the jackal well down south there. Uh, And the dung gate. What a name for a gate. Dung gate. Anyway. He examines the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. He then moves on towards uh, uh, the fountain gate and the king's pool. But there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So even, even trying to go around the city, the, the, the area, the walls were so destroyed and decimated, they, he wasn't even able to travel around inspecting the walls. So he went up the valley, the other way up the valley by night, examining the wall, and finally he turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. Now, after inspecting, uh, inspecting the, the state of things, he gathers the Israelites. Now it's time to, to, to have a chat with Israel, with the Israelite people. And he gathers the troops, the, the officials who didn't know where he had been or what he was doing, but he gathers them all together with the Druze, the priests, the nobles, and the others who, who would be doing the work. And he gives them a sobering vision of reality. He tells them how things actually are. In verse 17, he says, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Its gates have been burned with fire. One, um, one uh, Jewish historian uh, tells this story saying that Nehemiah would have gathered all of these officials in the temple gates, like in the front of the temple, uh, the, the, the kind of the peak of Mount, mountain that Jerusalem was on, so that as he's telling them these things, they could look around and see the decimation around them the ruins, that this city, which is, which is to house the dwelling place of God and the capital city of Israel, God's people, the walls have been destroyed. And walls in the, in the ancient Israel time is a sign of, of God's protection and, and a sign of, of, um, yeah, of protection. And if the walls are destroyed... It's a sign that God's abandoned them and a reminder of of the sin and the shame that led to that. 
Israel rejecting the God that set them apart. And here's the situation that Israel finds themselves. The walls broken down, Jerusalem decimated, Israelites in poverty, in shame. But that's not how things have to be. That's not how things have to be. The next thing Nehemiah shares is an inspiring vision of opportunity. Now, before, when Nehemiah comes, there was, there's this really interesting verse, which I kind of skipped over. It says, um, uh, verse 12, I set out during the night with a few others. I did not tell anyone what God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. He didn't come in saying, it's okay, I'm here. God's gift to Jerusalem is here. He didn't share uh, his calling because his calling wasn't about him. And uh, something like God's calling and God's calling on our life is something that um, we talk a lot about as Baptists. And on one hand, there is a calling that all of us have, that God calls us to be his children. He calls us into family with him. He calls us to be obedient to his word, to his law, to his ways. But there's also a situation where God calls us into a specific plan or purpose. But what we've got to remember is that God's call is not about me. It's about the mission. It's not about me. It's about the mission. And when, when Nehemiah gives them the vision of what Israel could be, of what Jerusalem could be, he doesn't say, I'm going to build a wall. He says, no, let's build a wall. He says, come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. Let's do this together. Let's do this together. And chapter 3, we'll hear in a couple of weeks' time, uh, all the Israelites were, were instructed to build the, the part of the wall just outside their house. Like everyone had a part to play in this vision, in this calling from God to rebuild the wall. It was inclusive. It was powerful. It was inspirational. But it still wasn't enough. It still wasn't enough. Because Israel had been, there had been people, I'm sure, who, who suggested, let's build the wall. And people who you know, were aware of the problem uh, that Israel was, was decimated, that the walls needed to be rebuilt. Like someone sent someone to Nehemiah to tell him about this. And yet it had been 100 years since Israel returned uh, uh, from King Cyrus when he allowed them to return from exile. Maybe 70 years since the temple was rebuilt. Maybe 15 years since Ezra came with his reforms. But still, no walls were rebuilt. And yet Nehemiah says something that turns that around. And that's what he says in verse 18. He told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. Nehemiah also gives Israel an inspiring vision of God's goodness. What Nehemiah does here is he shares, his, shares a testimony. He shares a story. He shares the story of what, of what happened with that king, that Nehemiah not only asked for release, but he also asked for safe passage. And not only did he ask for safe passage, he asked for resources and materials that could be used to build the walls. And that was given to him, not because of Nehemiah or anything else, but because of the gracious hand of God upon Nehemiah. It's the same words used to refer to the same thing. Nehemiah tells the Israelites, God is good and he's already at work. He's already working. And so that the result of that is it inspires action. Let us rise up and build. Let's start building, uh, Israel replies. So they began this good work and they rebuild the walls in record timing in 52 days. It took five months to replace the floorboards in our house. <laughs> 52 days, come on. How do we find prophetic purpose in the face of overwhelming despair? We need to be captured by a vision 
of God's goodness, of God's goodness. Now, a good question to ask when we're studying Scripture is, where do we fit into this passage? How do, how do we fit into this? And um, a very common reading is, is like, we're Nehemiah, and this is, this is a passage that brings great leadership lessons and things we can learn from and wisdom. And absolutely, there's lots of great wisdom we can learn from Nehemiah. But I think if we, if we were to consider where do we fit in this story, we're not Nehemiah, we're the Israelites. And Nehemiah isn't, a, isn't just a, a leadership model to lead like, but he's a forerunner of a king to follow. Because there's, there's a whole heap of parallels between Nehemiah and, and Jesus, both leaving power and privilege to humbly serve the people of God, both coming with a, a clear call from God to restore things, to renew, to repair, both facing opposition in and outside the people of God. Nehemiah had a call for Israel, a a call to arms. Jesus had a call to arms, a a vision, a calling for his followers. He said um, to his disciples before he ascended to heaven, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus gives his disciples, he gives us a mission, a task. Go and make disciples. But it's not just a task that he gives us. He also promises to be with us. Surely I am with you to the end of the age. Now this task that is set before us as a church, we could talk about the amalgamation. We're amalgamating with another church and with all the complexities that might involve, that's easy. We're entering a building program to build a new building in Mount Barker. Piece of cake. What will be incredibly challenging in this day and age will be leading people to follow Jesus. In our society, that's ever increasingly more secular, more sexular, more self-interested. It's got its own discipleship program, teaching program that that Jesus sends us into to uh, provide an alternative discipleship program to follow someone, to follow this king this person who lived 2,000 years ago who calls us to lay down our lives for him. We're, we're right in the middle of a pandemic, not COVID, but mental health. And there's ever increasing opposition. Uh, not only are we told what we can't say, we're told what we have to say. And now even recent news, we're, we're told who we're allowed to associate with or not associate with. Now, we might look out into the world and see overwhelming despair. But Jesus looks out, and when he sees the world, he sees sheep without a shepherd. He sees a world that is in desperate need for him. And he has sent us, his disciples, into the world to bring hope, to bring love, to bring light, to bring Jesus, to share Jesus in our world. And so how do we fulfill our prophetic purpose in the face of overwhelming despair? By capturing a vision of the goodness of God. And God is good. God is good. And he's shown us that through Jesus. Like God was completely aware of the situation of the world, yet he sent his son into the world. And Jesus experienced the worst the world had to offer, had to could throw to him. Beaten, mocked, dragged up a hill, crucified on a cross. And even at the peak of his suffering, he still called out about to God about the people crucifying him. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
And Jesus died. And, and even in that state of despair of the king of the world buried in a grave, after that, he rose again. He conquered death. He had victory over sin and death and shame and despair once and for all. And in that same power, he promises everyone who has faith in him will also be saved from death, will be saved from our sin, will be saved from despair. We have a good God who is at work in our world. My dad used to say, and he still does, there's a million reasons not to do something. There's always a million reasons why we shouldn't do something. But what is the reason to do it? What is the reason to do it? What is the reason to go out and share Jesus with the world? Because God is good and God is is working. Now, a really practical uh, application from tonight, I think, is we need to share stories. We need to share testimonies of God's goodness in our lives. And as particularly as, as things get harder and harder and whatever we might be facing in our own lives or as we go out and serve in mission or, or whatever, we need stories of God's goodness shared publicly and amongst friends and privately. And we need to hear these stories and share these stories. So after we're going to, I'm going to finish with another story. Um, have a song and then we're going to have a time of open mic sharing. Of Is there a story of God's goodness? Just a quick one, because we don't have forever, um, that you could share. An example of God working in your life, or or you've seen God working somewhere. Story of God's goodness. There'll be a time to share and to bring that to this community. But before they do that, just to finish things up, I, I want to return to our cliche story and, and share it with you again. But this time, reframing it to what I really think is going on in the world. So Terry. Uh, is there, and, and, and there's the flood, and that's um, Jerry. Sorry, Jerry, thank you. <laughs> Jerry. See, I've got Bob written here. <laughs> it's not Bob. Jerry. Um, <laughs> anyway, the flood's there, but he knows he's going to be rescued. He rescued. A, 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 a rescue team has called him and said, Jerry, it's all right. We're going to come save you. But while you're there, can you, can you save the neighbors next door? And he's like, all right, that's, that's good. All right, we'll do that. And he, he walks out the front and it's like, oh, the water's already at my ankles and it's a bit cold. It's inconvenient. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it. Maybe I'll send a letter or something. And the waters keep rising. And then someone comes along with a rowboat and says, hey, Jerry, do you need a rowboat for anything? And he says, oh, no, nah, it's all right. I've, I've, got, um, I've got a rescuer coming and, and the waters are a bit choppy and I don't, want, I don't want to put you out. So you just go on. So the guy goes on. Then a motor, the water keeps rising. A motorboat comes. Jerry, do you need a motorboat for anything? Oh, no, nah, it's all right. I don't want to inconvenience you. You know, it's, it's a bit too tricky. And, I, you know, I might damage the property. I might, you know, don't worry. It's, don't worry about it. And the water keeps rising. Then the rescuer comes, he sends down the rope and says, is there, Jerry, is there anyone else to save? And he's like, oh, there's the neighbor, but the, the, the wind is too high and the waters are too choppy. Don't worry about it. And then the, the, the guy rescues him and they fly off and the rescuer later asks, why, why didn't you save your neighbor? And he says, oh, it was too hard. It's too, too difficult a situation. And the rest of you said, I sent a rowboat, a powerboat, and a helicopter. What more could you need? God has sent us into the world to share the light, the love of Jesus. And he's given us everything we need to fulfill that prophetic purpose, to fulfill that mission. And what we need to be doing is encouraging each other with testimonies, stories of God's goodness so that we can recognize God working through us and in us for his glory, for his goodness. The Israelites, they turned from apathy 
into action uh, through a story of God's goodness. They unlearned their helplessness through a captivating image of the goodness of God. That's a story we need to press into. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story. We thank you for the great story uh, that Jesus lived, died, rose again, and that we are saved. We are forgiven. We are loved through him. God, we pray that you would equip us to to live out that mission, that mandate of of sharing Jesus with the world in this, this challenging world that we find ourselves. And Lord, we pray that you would keep showing us your goodness so that we could keep sharing your goodness with those around us in the church and those around us out of the church so that people might see how good you are because you are good. You are the best. And Lord, we, we just pray as we, as we worship and we pray as we share stories of your goodness, that you would just lift our hearts, lift our eyes, lift our minds, that we'd fall even more deeply in love with you, more captivated by who you are, and more inspired to go out and to serve on your mission. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.